Good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you are in the world. We'll just give it a minute for everyone to join us, log on before we continue. Okay, I've got the green light to proceed now, so we'll just make a quick start. Welcome to today's webinar on exploring the three E's in construction arbitration, evidence, experts, and efficiency. My name is Kushbu Shadapuri, and on behalf of El Tamimi and Company, it's a pleasure for me to host you and be your moderator for today's session. Today's webinar is centered around salient features of construction arbitration. The 2019 Queen Mary International Arbitration Survey indicated that while parties still prefer international arbitration as their preferred mechanism to resolve construction disputes, there is a perception that construction arbitration takes longer, costs more, or entails colossal volumes of evidence than it ought to. Now, just to get your perspective on what you would consider as the most problematic aspect of construction arbitration, we thought we would start off with a quick poll on this. I should emphasize most problematic because ideally, we would all want to tick all the four options that you'd have on your screen in a moment. So this should pop up on your screens any minute now. While you consider one of the four options to the question, I will quickly introduce our speakers for today's session. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Zaina Obeid. Zaina is a partner with Obeid Law Firm in Beirut. She's qualified to practice in Beirut and Paris and acts as counsel in a number of international arbitration matters across the MENA region. She's also frequently appointed as arbitrator and tribunal secretary. Second, we have Dr. Krina Baltag, senior lecturer at Stockholm University. Krina has extensive experience in international arbitration, which involves her involvement as counsel, arbitrator, as well as head of an arbitral institution. Queen is also editor of a number of leading arbitration journals worldwide. Next, we have Dana Er, partner at Eldon Law in Singapore. Dana is a New York and Singapore qualified lawyer specializing in international construction disputes. She has been recognized by the Singapore Business Review and the Lawyer Monthly Woman in Law Award for her work in dispute resolution. Last but not the least, we have Tom Kapapa, partner and head of operations with HKA in Qatar. Tom's expertise includes working as a delay and quantum expert in complex civil and building infrastructure projects. He has been recognized by the who's who legal rankings in the last two years. I'd second those recognitions as I've had the good fortune of working alongside him and thankfully not opposite him on a number of my cases. So with that, we'll just wait for the poll results to come in. Uh, it looks, and it's, it's really interesting. It looks like people generally consider cost and the time taken in the arbitration, as well as large amounts of evidence to be the most problematic aspects. So I think with that, you know, this would be a timely place for us to start today's discussion. Before we start, if you do have any questions, then please type them out in the Q&A box below. We will have some time to answer these questions at the end of today's session. So our first topic for today's discussion is the different types of evidence that we typically see or would expect to see in construction arbitration. Zena, to start off with, what types of evidence do you usually see being submitted by the parties in construction arbitration? Thank you, Kushbu, for your introduction and for this very interesting question, especially after the result of the polls. In fact, uh, there are three types of evidence that we usually see being submitted by parties and construction arbitration proceedings. First of all, documentary evidence. It is very important. Cases tend to be, in fact, fact intensive, and tribunals like to see the contemporaneous records, such as letters, minutes of meetings, progress reports, scheduling and planning information, cost data, etc. 
Second, it's factual witness evidence. It is key, for example, in the context of complex delay and disruption claims, where the witness would need to explain what was happening on site. Witness statements can be quite effective in spelling out what was causing disruption, at what point in time, and its effect on productivity levels. The third type of evidence is expert evidence, typically on delay and quantum matters. Sometimes we see experts appointed to tackle disruption and technical matters. For example, in the context of engineering variations. In addition, in a number of proceedings, parties are increasingly opting for the submission of expert evidence on points of flow. In the Middle East, for instance, there are a number of issues which often finds themselves into expert evidence, namely issues of termination, validity of paid when paid provisions, validity of strict notification provisions, liquidated damages, and other points of flow. This often arises from the fact that that a number of standard forms of contract, which are intended to operate in a very specific manner in a specific system, do not operate in the same way, for example, where the applicable law is of a Middle Eastern country. Finally, uh, in some mega infrastructure cases, we see several experts on different disciplines in addition to millions of documents. Managing evidence become key from the tribunals and from the council's perspective. Council should present to the tribunal essential evidence and resist the temptation of flooding the tribunal with unnecessary document documentation, which is not conducive to the efficient disposition of the matter. Thanks, Zena. And, and that's very interesting because efficiency is a topic we're going to come to um, in a few questions down. But so, Zena, you touched on documentary, factual, technical expert, and legal expert evidence. Krina, are all these different types of evidence equivalent to each other in value? Or is there a hierarchy in that some types of evidence have a higher probative value than others in arbitration proceedings? Thank you very much, Kushbu, and I hope everybody can hear me well. Uh, and uh, thank you to my dear colleagues uh, for this interesting discussion and for to Zena for setting the scene on uh, on the evidence. Uh, I agree that construction uh, um, arbitration construction disputes usually see generous variety of different kind of evidence and in considerable volume. Uh, but I have to disclose one point is that in the past years, I could see that arbitrators, uh, they're trying to go green on this as well. So uh, fr from the early days uh, when I started to arbitrate with, with rooms full of documents uh, that could not fit in one room maybe, uh, now we're moving to maybe a, a, a pen drive or even a, a, a transfer uh, um, uh, through, through secure databases. Uh, now, different disputes may see, as you could, as you could hear, different uh, uh, different type of evidence. Some may see uh, limited use of this kind of evidence. If we take the example of a, a straightforward a dispute dealing with non-payment of an IPC, uh, but when you compare to other complex disputes, as Zeno was mentioning, uh, where perhaps there is a need of uh, material evidence, for example, samples removed from the structure of the construction and tested, uh, and of course, site visits and so on. Um, and also what is interesting, and I think in particular to arbitrators, uh, is that there are certain peculiarities when it comes to evidence in construction disputes. Uh, just to name uh, one, one, one example, uh, the factual witnesses, as mentioned by Zina, uh, these are usually highly technically qualified persons. So there is a, a, a really fine line between uh, uh, fa factual evidence and expert evidence, I would say. Um, but of course, this is all useful. And, uh, and your question was, is there a hi hierarchy of, of the evidence? 
Um, so what should the tribunal do when faced with different kinds of evidence presented? And, and my answer is the tribunal would not or should not uh, have a pre-established hierarchy of the evidence submitted. That is uh, documents, contemporary documents to, work, to be worth more than a site visit and so on. Of course, the intimate conviction of, of the arbitral tribunal cannot be ignored, uh, but uh, one has to start, of course, to look at the arbitration rules and laws applicable and see if there is any guidance there. Uh, and you'll, you'll be surprised to find out that there is not much in there. Uh, but if one looks at the generally accepted uh, practice in arbitration, and I refer here to the IBA rules on the taking of evidence in international arbitration, which now have the 2020 update, uh, we have the Article 9, which uh, refers to the freedom of the tribunal to determine the admissibility, relevance, materiality, and weight of the evidence. And also where uh, there is a failure by the party to submit evidence, of course, the tribunal may and has the, the, the opportunity to adopt adverse inferences. But of course, uh, and, and this Article 9 obviously is in line with the different arbitration rules, um, uh, including with the UNCITRAL arbitration rules and so on. But as such, the evidence evaluation is left to the discretion of the tribunal, unless, as I mentioned, there is something specific in the applicable provisions. The tribunal shall determine the weight and sufficiency, because this is something that Zaina mentioned or alluded to, the, the, the weight and sufficiency of the presented evidence. And of course, uh, this also uh, is very much linked to the efficiency of the arbitration proceedings. Thanks, Karina. So let's just turn to the role that evidence plays in the different construction claims we usually see. Those of us involved in construction disputes know there are some claims that have a higher threshold or higher standard of evidence that have to be mapped for a successful claim. Overhead and profits is one of them, but that's a discussion we'll leave for a different day. Today's discussion will focus on disruption claims in particular. So if we just take a step back, and Dana, coming to you, what are disruption claims seeking to establish and why are they so difficult to prove? Thanks, Krishpu. Thanks for the kind introduction. So disruption claims really, the objective of it is to demonstrate the loss of productivity and hence additional loss and expense over and above what would have incurred if not for the disruption event. So a disruption claim is different from a delay claim because a delay would involve a critical delay affecting the completion date, but a disruption may not. And a disruption claim is different from a delay claim because a delay claim would involve time-related claims, while a disruption claim is based on cost overrun associated with altered work. So in summary, a delay claim is when you are simply late on your project and the disruption claim is a change to the planned work. So why is it notoriously difficult to make out a disruption claim? Uh, this boils down to the standard of um, proof that is required because to prove a disruption claim, you will have to show a few factors. And the first is that you will have to show that the events that occurred entitle you to loss and expense generally, and that the events caused the disruption and finally, you will have to show that the disruption caused the loss and expense or even damage that you are seeking. And the first thing that is very often overlooked is, the, is your notice provision. Uh, there may be a general reluctance early on in the project when things are going well and good to, pro, to fail to provide that sort of notices, which could eventually prove to be fatal to your disruption claim. So that's the first point. And the second point is that it can be difficult to identify which set of events exactly contributed to your disruption claim. And the difficulty is exacerbated by the lack of contemporaneous documents. And uh, Zena spoke about this briefly. And by contemporaneous record keeping, I mean a wide range of documents such as minutes, personal notebooks, photographs, which could all help identify what exactly caused the lower productivity. And my final point is that the difficulty also lies in the fact that you will have to show that the event caused the loss and how you are quantifying these losses. And in the market, we have a number of methods um, in which you could try to measure your productivity. We have productivity-based methods as well as cost-based methods. 
And by productivity methods, I mean, for example, the measured mile analysis method, which tends to require better record keeping uh, versus, you know, cost based methods, which are less, for example, documents intensive. But the general rule is that, you know, the less the method requires of you in terms of documents, and the easier the method for proving disruption, the less likely you are to succeed in your disruption claim. So just to wrap up on my point, it's all down back to basics. It's all about evidence. It's all about your records. So if you're seeking to, to make out a disruption claim, you have to start early on and you have to uh, gather that sort of records that's essential for your claim. Always keep records in your emails to the other side, have notes on how many workers you've deployed on site, what sort of resources have been deployed. And, and if possible, have videos or even photographs to, to constantly update to show what sort of resources have been deployed to site. And that's all I have on my end. Over to Kushbu, thank you. Thanks, Dana. So while we're touching on the different assessment methods of a disruption claim, Tom, it will be useful to get your views as an expert on this. When you are acting as an expert in arbitration proceeding, are there any particular documents or record you would expect from the parties in order to assess a disruption claim? And how important is the role of claim consultants in disruption claims? Are there an important feature in successful disruption claims? Thanks, thanks, Kushbu, and for the introduction. Thank you very much again, everyone attending. Disruption, uh, there's a same old saying on this, records, records, records. So I'll, I'll repeat that. And I think uh, Karina and everyone have uh, emphasized on evidence. But I think it's important, I think Karina touched on this, that it's, it's, it's ensuring it's not unnecessary documentation that you have. So just in terms of documentation, and then of course the claims consultant, I'll address this in three points first. So the first point is, I'm going to look at why disruption actually fails, uh, uh, usually in, in disputes. And then I'll look at uh, why the issue of isolating compensable disruption is a big problem. And then after that, I'll try and look at how do you address the, the shortfalls of doing a, 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 a disruption analysis and of course, opportunities that I think are there. And then I'll end up uh, talking about how the claims consultants can actually assist in, in ensuring disruption claims are successful or presented properly. So with regards to problems, why disruption claims fail, again, I uh, this is experience from experience. I, I believe there's lack of preparedness from contractors. I think uh, Zina touched on this. You need to start early collecting your documentation and all that, uh, but it appears uh, contractors over the years, they've still not realized that disruption will always happen on a project. The issue is whether you can recover some of the loss and expense due to employer events. So disruption will always happen, but contractors are always uh, not prepared for it. Uh, and simply disruption, I think I, I won't go through the description of it, is, is, is a productivity loss. And it's obviously relating actual loss and expense to that productivity loss, which a contractor or project will always suffer. But it's, it's really trying to establish what can be compensable from that. And that, that's the, uh, the biggest issue. And of course, disruption will always happen because contractors own uh, methodologies or sequencing of work or planning of works will contribute to disruption. And of course, there might be employer issues as well. So it's, it's important to keep your records from the start and not to wait at the end of a project, which is usually the case, and, and raise the disruption claim. And of course, you might have witness evidence, um, but that is after the fact. Uh, and, and unfortunately, disruption is an actual event. So you, you only incur loss and expense when a disruption happens. It's not, it's not a future event. Uh, and, and therefore you need to start before, uh, for every project once it starts. So the issue of isolating what I'd call compensable disruption um, is, is clearly the biggest problem is when you look at 
how disruption evolves on a project. There's so many issues that would lead to it. You've got logistical issues, you've got supplier delay issues, you've got over mobilization of resources or under mobilization, you've got sequencing of work, you can there's also mismanagement of resources on site. All these matters are really a contractor's problem when you look at them. Of course, these may be increased or exacerbated because of employer changes, but it's important to try and isolate what would be because of the employer changes, because these issues will always happen on a project. So, uh, uh, like I say, you, you might have lack of access, uh, which is an employer issue, and that may increase the, the effects of logistics uh, on site. Not to say that you, you won't have logistical issues on site anyway, but you always have that. So it's the isolation of those issues to try and isolate uh, what evidence you actually need to support your disruption. So uh, I'll look at addressing this, the, the criticism first, before I get to the information that's required. So usually uh, in my approach is I try to look at what the criticisms will be to a disruption analysis. And these are usually, like I say, uh, trying to isolate what is compensable and what is not. And it's always worth trying to look at disruption in different um, analysis, if you like. Uh, using uh, uh, the measured mouth, which is, uh, I would suggest is the best uh, methodology you should use, um, and to look at it in different scenarios. So you can look at it in area-wise, you can look at it in trade-wise, you can look at it in, in uh, uh, time-wise, you can look at it in event-wise to try and see how the, uh, the frequency of disruption is, just to understand and to see how you can start isolating the compensable disruption. So I try to use uh, the measured mouth using different approaches to, cut, to get a wide range of results to actually see what the disruption would be. And that helps to, to eliminate all the criticisms you have. And I, 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 I call this as an opportunity because if you are a claimant's expert, it's usually the case that the claimant's expert will assess disruption but the respondents expert will usually, whether it's by instructions, will usually not assess disruption. And the approach will be to critique, to critique the methodology of the, of the claimants experts. So, so there is an opportunity here in the sense that if you address the criticism that will come in, and it's really the tribunal's decision to, to consider whether disruption did happen or not based on evidence, factual evidence uh, and all. Uh, I think there's an opportunity for the expert, uh, for the claimant to actually uh, push a, dis a disruption claim over the line. So having, uh, having said all that, so when we look at information, again, I go to preparedness. So I always wonder why contractors would not record disruption every Every month, because they know exactly the quantities of work they've done, they know exactly the cost they've incurred in the month, and they know exactly what they intended to have achieved in that month. So there's, there is a disruption, whether it's compensable or whether it's not, there is a disruption. So I always wonder why they would not, uh, I think uh, Dana raised the issue of notification. So I wonder why they would not do that on a monthly basis because there will be disruption from, from the start of the project. Now, the issue would be whether that is compensable or not, but at least that addresses the issue of notification. It also addresses the issue that you've quantified the overall disruption. The issue is whether there was excusable events. And, and that allows you to monitor the disruption on month by month, as opposed to leaving it to the end and getting witness statements to cover the story of what was happening or the issues that may have caused it. And again, on a, on a weekly basis or monthly basis, why not report on the issues that you think would be causing that disruption, whether it's a sequencing issue, whether there's logistical issues or whether there's changes or late information from the client, why not record it on a weekly basis? Because then you, uh, the, the witness statements of fact, which will be written four or five years down the line, 
there's already record that supports that, as opposed to try and uh, reflect and remember what happened four years before. The other major uh, documents, uh, again, for me, I look at is the progress program. So progress uh, uh, a type of uh, a disruption analysis is, is obviously very favored. It's obviously the measured mile and it's project specific. Um, the, the, the most important document which people sort of under, underestimate is the look ahead programs. It's very usual that you find reports on site where there's a timesheet, there's a daily record of people, what they're doing, how much quantities they've done, uh, how many people were working, but there's always uh, the, the missing link of what was actually planned or intended to be done on that specific day. So the fallback to that is the weekly look ahead programs, because these are the, the immediate uh, 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 sort of plans of what's going on on site on a day to day basis and that gives you the understanding of what uh, you know the, the project team is planning to achieve on a weekly basis so that that's a, a usual important document. You also need marked up drawings now these are important because they actually tie up to the look ahead programs and also tie up to the daily reports which record activities and, and, and plans or, or actual quantities that have been achieved. So these are the ones I always see as, as the, the most important documentation. I think the, the disconnect now comes to the allocating cost, actual cost to all these specific activities. As you would understand on big projects, you. You, you may have 10,000 laborers on site. So it's very difficult to actually allocate where the cost is. Um, a lot of projects now, they, they're using electronic uh, uh, biometric uh, sort of record of people on site. So that evidence is quite important. And that can be tied into the uh, employers or employees or laborers wages uh, or invoices from labor supply companies. So it's always important to try and tie this. It's, it's very difficult to tie the actual cost that unfortunately disruption is actual loss and expense. So you have to tie that back in. The other thing is, is to try and to ensure the, uh, the uh, I've, I've used this as rate of progress notifications. Now, the, one of the criticisms that disruption faces is how have you assessed the contractors uh, shortfalls and normally on projects engineers will be issuing rate of progress notifications specific to matters or in weekly meetings uh, or in monthly meetings it's always important that the expert actually considers this because if the expert has actually considered these issues and assessed them it, it's always likely that you are covering the issues that are deemed to be contractors on uh, shortfalls um, and of course, you've got monthly reports, monthly updates, uh, uh, which you can look at. So that's really what I see as the major or uh, actually the most important documents I'd look at uh, uh, in terms of a disruption analysis. And of course, disruption is uh, unfortunately is different on different projects and, and different contractors will keep different records. It's always important to assess what records they actually have. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the threshold of actually getting uh, a disruption claim or uh, a quantum, a quantum expert to actually get it over the line, the threshold is very, very high. So uh, unfortunately, it's records, records, records. Uh, uh, you'd have to and leave it to the expert to decide what is necessary and unnecessary. So you have to just keep all the record. Now, going to the last point uh, regarding claims consultants. I hope there's a few claims consultants on the call. Um, uh, they are my friends and colleagues. <laughs> um, I think, I think uh, to be uh, fair is, uh, I think con uh, if claims consultants are used proactively, I think uh, they are very useful to this process because they clearly understand uh, you know, what's required to, to do a disruption analysis so they can assist the contractor to set up these systems to ensure that the record is, 
is being monitored and addressed on a you know, constant monthly basis. Unfortunately, claims consultants are only brought in at the end. Um, uh, and, and unfortunately, being claims consultants, they, uh, they, uh, the evidence or uh, the approach of how they do the analysis, uh, again, uh, may inflate uh, the disruption claims. And that becomes a problem uh, for the client, uh, for the expert, uh, and of course, for the credibility to the tribunal. So I hope uh, claims experts will agree with me on that. If they were used proactively as opposed to reactively, I think they'll be very useful to the process. Thanks, Tom. I mean, it's quite obvious that disruption claims are definitely one of the more delicate claims that we see in construction dispute in terms of establishing unproductivity, which Tom, you referred to as the isolation issue, quantifying disruption, ascertaining what is compensable and allocating the cost. But by no means are they the only ones. Where delay claims are concerned, another area that's considered somewhat precarious is where there are competing delays in projects. And these are known as concurrent delays. Zena, what made concurrent delays so tricky? Concurrent delay uh, is first and foremost a question of fact. It is true that it's also amongst the most contentious and complex matters and construction claims. Uh, to start with the basic definition, uh, concurrent delay is commonly described as circumstances where two events, one within the responsibility of the employer and another within the responsibility of the contractor might be regarded as causing or contributing to delay on the project. More precisely, John Marin Cuisy defines concurrency, and I would like to quote here, a period of project overrun, which is caused by two or more effective causes of delay which are of approximately equal causative potency. The emphasis here is on the notion of equal causative potency. In practice, there are three key considerations which make the issue of concurrency a tricky one to resolve. Firstly, there is no unique approach in defining and assessing concurrent delay. It is therefore important for contracting parties to pay close attention on how to draft clauses dealing with concurrency in their agreement. For instance, the parties could focus on properly characterizing concurrent delays and defining the boundaries of entitlement to time and monetary compensation in the event of concurrent delays. The second challenge is to prove true concurrency. Since the parties need to prove that both events cause delay, one by the employer and another by the contractor, and are of the same magnitude, this is not an easy task. It is a factual issue. To, to take an example, in hospitality projects typically composed of several buildings, a contractor caused a delay event which may occur at the same time as an employer delay event would not necessarily be considered as concurrent delay if the contractor delay happened in another area which was not in the critical path. So, so as I said, it's a factual issue that needs to be proven. And facts has already been dealt with Dana, Tom, and Krina. It's very, very important. It is therefore important that parties focus on delineating in their submission the process that needs to be followed to prove or disapprove the presence of concurrent delays, as well as the financial implications of a finding of a concurrent delay. In relation to the last point that I would like to address, in addition to the contract, the applicable law is often a relevant consideration to determine the legal consequences on entitlement of an event of concurrency. So the knowledge of the applicable law is, is very important. Uh, so th this is what I had to say and back to you, Kushbu. Zena, thank you. Actually, that, that's quite a good elaboration on concurrent delays, I have to say. But just, Tom, coming back to you, um, as an expert, what are the possible ways that experts usually tackle the issue of concurrent delays in their delay analysis? 
Thanks, Kushbu and uh, Zina for that. Uh, again, I'm, I'm the orthodox expert here. I do both quantum and delay. So uh, I live by this road on this uh, and die by it. So concurrency, uh, uh, unfortunately, and I, I won't go through the definition. I think the definition, if it was followed, it's a very narrow uh, uh, definition of what would be concurrency. So. Uh, if that was adopted everywhere else, I think the issue of concurrency will be very minor. I think but the problem is, 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 not, is, is how different regions see what would be concurrency and what is not. So, uh, and, and this is why I suspect contracts will, be, uh, will stay away from trying to define it just to, to leave it open for people like me to uh, to try and convince everyone on the call this is concurrency. <laughs> so I'll try. So it, it is very narrow view. And, and, and if you follow it, concurrency, uh, it's very, it will be very difficult to actually show that there's two activities happening at the same time, having an equal impact on the completion. It will be very rare to do that. And, and, and the, the, the reason being, especially that uh, when you come to arbitrations, most of these disputes are happening 10, you know, five, five years after the project started. Uh, you're looking at a project which may have been running for two, three years. So you're having to deal with uh, assessing critical delay at certain periods of time to try and uh, see whether there was concurrency. So you, you, they are not, again, affects on how you are going to look at the periods of delay. So you're not going to look at every day or every week uh, period. You, you, you have to be very uh, accommodating, especially uh, it's a very time cost issue. Again, I think uh, arbitration is about effectiveness. So it, 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 when you narrow that down, it becomes clearly impossible that you actually identify two events which are running at the same time and causing the same effect. So normally, again, uh, like I said, the periods are rationalized based on what's actually going on. So uh, experts uh, would obviously look at when the programs were changed or when key events were happening to try and see uh, close to that, to that time what may have been critical or concurrent at the same time uh, to sort of narrow that down. So, so that unfortunately creates the, the gaps that you would have because these periods will not be on a daily basis. There might be a period of six months uh, and you don't look at what happened every month of the six months. You're just looking at what the effect was at the end of six months. So that, that could be the problem. And the other issue you have is uh, uh, the uh, uh, contractors programs that you are using may not be updated regularly. Now, contractors will submit progress uh, programs, but for some reason, contractors are reluctant to submit revised programs, which uh, uh, revised programs, which, uh, which actually include additional works or additional changes, changes to the sequence of work. So that can't be captured from the programs uh, that are normally available. So that again, creates the problem of uh, of, of, uh, of uh, defining where concurrency would have happened. Um, the other, I suppose the best solution would be for experts to agree where uh, the periods where concurrency is and actually then uh, delve into the evidence to actually ascertain how much concurrency there would have been. But uh, unfortunately that is, is, uh, is a wishful thinking for me. I hope uh, that would happen. But interestingly, uh, Doug Jones has, has been uh, obviously promoting a, a different way of approaching arbitrations. And, and I, I do like his approach where the experts before they even get into doing the analysis and the detail and the reports, they have to sit down and agree the methodologies and the issues and agree a joint statement. I think this will narrow down the issue of concurrency because at that point in time, both experts will deal with the issue of concurrency and either they will agree the periods 
where concurrency would have happened or how long the concurrency would be. But at least that narrows it down uh, in terms of what evidence you'd have to show in terms of concurrency. So hopefully that will be the, the norm going forward uh, on, on concurrency to try and narrow down the evidence that should be required because it's, it's become so subjective. Saying that, again, like I said, in, in different regions, concurrency is seen differently. Uh, obviously, common law, you, you follow the SCL uh, definition, which is very narrow. Uh, in this region, unfortunately, I, I'm not sure whether other regions are the same. Uh, they look at it as a parallel delay or competing delay. So th this is completely different to what concurrency is. So uh, a parallel delay is any delay, whether it's affecting completion or not, it, it's happening at the same time. So the, the scenario Zena uh, gave earlier where you got three different buildings of the same project, but one building is critically delaying completion, the other one is not. In this region, it may be seen as concurrent delay because they look at it as a parallel delay or competing delay um, on, on that. So the, the, again, my approach with, uh, with uh, concurrency, uh, never mind the issue of hopefully agreeing with the expert before, uh, particularly because concurrency is, is a defense by the respondent with regards to prolongation. And it's because it's a response by the respondent, it, it's obviously very left very open. It becomes, I think, more of a, a merit or contractual issue as opposed to a technical issue. So, uh, uh, so and, and, and because of that, it leaves the experts with, uh, you know, a wide view of how you address concurrency because it, it's more seen as a defense. So what I try to do again is to try and agree what, what we would deem to be near critical path because in construction, a day or two difference of impact is, is critical, you know, because things change so rapidly on a construction site. So it's to try and define what you would see as near critical so that the, this issue of having two events, having the same impact on completion if they are near critical, then at least then you agree uh, that they would be deemed to be concurrent. So the near critical definition is, I've tried to find this, but it's not there uh, specifically, but I always see it as uh, in, in a lot of construction uh, projects, uh, the, the specification of how the program is set may, may, may define each activity to be the longest activity duration should be 14 days or 28 days. Uh, I read that to be, this is the closest you would be to monitor uh, an activity on how it's progressing on site. So for me, that defines the period of what I'm looking at as near critical. In some projects, it could be 14 days for uh, maximum length of activity. I use that as actually defining how closely monitoring the the program should be so 14 days becomes near critical so that's uh, uh, of course uh, and once you get that then you can actually look at the float paths not critical path because critical path will be one critical path um, is to look at the float paths and try to do a, a, a but for sort of approach where you look at all uh, float paths which fall within the near critical and actually assess whether it's they are caused by employer or contractor to actually try and narrow down what concurrency is. So this is more of a elaborate technical side of it, but hopefully Doug Jones, uh, um, you know, recommendations are really uh, embraced in, 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 the, in the industry. But I, I, I'll, I, I know this is about delay, but I'll just mention on the quantum side. So uh, on the quantum side, again, uh, if, if experts are probably brought on, uh, on the involved much earlier on, the they, they, they approach to concurrency can be, uh, uh, there's an opportunity to ensure that the issue is minimized. Uh, the scenario Zena uh, actually gave is you've got three towers on the same project. Uh, so what I normally try to do is to define what you would call 
uh, the common team, which is the common project management team. So these people will be on site for the duration of the project. And then you will have the task management team. So they are managing each building. And once each building is finished, you can demobilize them off site. So long as you can separate or isolate these resources, then you are left with the common team because the common team will be affected by concurrency because they are the ones on the critical path. And that, again, is a way to hopefully maximize opportunity for the claimant to deal with uh, uh, concurrency. Tom, thanks for this. You know, these are all really interesting and relevant issues in construction arbitration that we could spend hours and hours discussing. I mean, the joint statement that Professor Doug Jones advocates, which you touched on, that's obviously to assist the experts to narrow the dispute between the parties early on. And that helps with the efficiency in construction arbitration ultimately. That's our third E in today's three E's, efficiency. Efficiency in construction arbitration essentially means that all of the procedural aspects of the arbitration and the substantive aspects aspects of the claims are satisfied in a cost-effective manner. Krina, it will be very useful for our joiners today to get your thoughts on how achievable is cost-effective construction arbitration and how important is the choice of counsel, arbitrator, and expert in achieving this? Um, uh, thank you, Kushbo. It's rather difficult to discuss efficiency after we heard uh, uh, how complex the disputes are and uh, how, how voluminous we have. Uh, the, the batch of evidence and the experts and so on. But uh, I think, uh, I, think uh, I can assure you that construction arbitration can be uh, efficient and most of the proceedings are indeed uh, uh, efficient. Um, I would like to highlight that uh, and, and uh, uh, going back to what Tom was mentioning, it, it is important that everybody that is involved in the arbitration proceedings uh, adopt uh, an efficient uh, strategy, an efficient coordination, uh, as well as an efficient management of the dispute. So it's not only about arbitrators, it's also about, as you said, Kushbo, about the parties, it's about the experts. Uh, everybody involved will have to do their part, and I'll, I'll get to this in a second. Um, and it, what is, uh, I think, very important is that um, uh, usually arbitration institutions that uh, in general manage, uh, administer the construction disputes, um, they tend to be proactive and support uh, those involved in the arbitration proceedings. And they do that either for the, for the secretariat, for the council involved, or uh, they, do by, they do that by providing certain uh, guidance, written guidance, to uh, arbitrators or to the council. And, and one very good example uh, of this is the ICC's Commission Report on Construction Industry Arbitrations. And I think this is useful. Uh, and for those uh, interested who are, who are listening, um, they, they, they update it regularly. Uh, starting with 2001, ICC provides this, uh, this report. And it's really relevant because it, it, it encapsulates the the, the, the practice of, of construction arbitration, as well as with gi giving useful advice. It is true that uh, the ICC report, uh, it's uh, uh, intended primarily for arbitrators, but as I said, it's very useful for everybody involved. So for, from my experience, I would say that the key uh, to efficient provisions, to, to efficient proceedings uh, would be um, uh, the early management of the case, that's first. Uh, establishing different checking points, in particular where we have complex uh, arbitration proceedings uh, with uh, several claims, uh, counterclaims, uh, amended claims, and so on. Third, um, ensuring that the amendments of the procedural calendar are limited or non-existent, hopefully. Uh, that's the ideal scenario. And fourth, uh, the, streaming, uh, the streamlining of the arbitration and also the evidence, which is uh, something that I'll not touch upon. Uh, but I would say that uh, the early management of the case, um, which is very much related to the limitations on the amendment of the procedural calendar, as well as with the establishing these checking points, is, is really important in, in, in a construction arbitration. Uh, and we have to uh, admit that obviously these are arbitrations conducted by big teams of counsel, as I said, expert witnesses, 
and of course the arbitrators and everybody will have to find uh, a, a common time to deal with, uh, um, with the arbitration proceedings, either a case management conference or pre-hearing pre uh, uh, calls or hearings. And so everything has to match, convert, converge in one point. And that is rather difficult. And this is why uh, managing the case efficiently at an early stage, uh, setting a procedural calendar and having minimal uh, alterations of this procedural calendar, as well as because of the complexity of the cases, it might run for more than two years, let's say, the arbitrators should ensure that uh, uh, at critical points, uh, they will go back to the parties and, and check on how uh, they're doing uh, in the arbitration. For example, it may be that not all the uh, issues in dispute remain in dispute. Uh, or if there is a need for any supplementary uh, submission and so on. That has to be proactively managed by the arbitrator. Um, I would also say that, uh, of course, the, the proactive management of the case uh, would definitely touch upon the evidence. Uh, it was mentioned, uh, uh, obviously, that uh, the, the, the relevant documents, uh, for example, should be submitted in the arbitration. Uh, so, so the the of course there is a fine line between this uh, and the, and the, the what the tribunals can do, um, but definitely there there is room for the arbitrators to manage uh, the evidence in a in a in a in a proactive way. The rounds of written submissions we know that not always it, it is necessary to have uh, two free rounds of written submissions. Uh, of course, managing the bifurcation of the proceedings. Uh, numerous uh, arb construction arbitrations will see uh, uh, intermediate phase dealing with the uh, DAB, with the DAB decisions and their binding effect. Uh, so that has to be also managed because obviously it impacts the procedural calendar. Um, of course, dealing with multi-party and multi-contract issues, and, and Tom was referring to the fact that uh, perhaps the construction arbitration would come at the point uh, after three or five years uh, uh, after, after the event occurring. But we also see quite often arbitrations occurring, um, um, many arbitrations actually in the same project occurring, and arbitrators will have to deal with previous arbitral awards uh, issued and how that impacts the, the present arbitration. So it's, it's a massive complexity in the sense. Um, of course, on streamlining the case, and I'll not touch too much upon this, each uh, tribunal has its specific approach. For example, arbitral tribunal may want to require the parties to submit an agreed chronology of undisputed facts, which is sometimes quite difficult, quite impossible to achieve, but very useful. Uh, also, for example, list of key personnel, key persons, uh, as well as glossary of terms. These are very useful and would save a lot of time to the tribunal. Uh, and some tribunals prefer, as I said, in, in, in complex arbitrations with uh, numerous pleadings, they would prefer to have a working document. We usually call it the, uh, the Scott schedule, where, where we, we record the, the pleadings of each uh, claimant and respondent uh, and this in particular is useful uh, just to have an idea of what, what is uh, um, disputed and what that type of evidence is submitted uh, and obviously uh, having a more efficient proceedings. Um, of course, uh, the documents uh, that are submitted in the proceedings, uh, I would say that this circles back to my, my first points, uh, but I will not, uh, I'll, I'll leave this for, for a, a subsequent question. So in today's poll earlier on, one third of our joiners actually thought that the large amounts of evidence and documents were for them the most problematic aspect of construction arbitration. Now, Karina, you alluded to this. One way to control cost in arbitration is to streamline evidence. And Dina, do you just want to weigh in on this? How would you do this? And what is the role that smart technology play these days in streamlining evidence in arbitration proceedings? Thanks, Kushpo. So one way to go about streamlining um, evidence, especially in construction disputes, which are very document uh, intensive, one way would be to consider employing electronic discovery platforms. 
because discovery itself is very often the largest expense that uh, a client would incur for uh, a construction dispute. And just speaking from experience, um, the benefits of employing an electronic discovery platform in your construction dispute would obviously be um, savings in, in discovery costs for document intensive disputes, because there is a systematic process for data to be collected to ensure that all relevant evidence is actually captured. And then it goes through a process of deduplication to ensure that all repeat documents are completely filtered out and that council will not have to spend time looking through those documents. And um, there is also a process to ensure that uh, relevant documents are then um, chained together. You know, for example, when you have email chains, all these uh, relevant documents, if they are one chain, the um, platform would allow you to actually chain these documents together. Um, that's of course after you have applied the keywords that you want to apply to filter out all the irrelevant documents. And finally, um, there is a coding process where you can actually tag the documents that are relevant uh, for uh, privilege. So if you want to exclude privileged documents, you can actually tag those documents to say that they are privileged and that they should not be looked at by um, the opposing party. Um, but that said, of course, there are issues that we have to be alive to. Uh, before one purchases an electronic discovery platform, it's important to check its capabilities, especially whether um, that particular platform is able to work through documents of different file formats, what sort of file formats you are talking about in your project, uh, and also uh, language capabilities, you know, especially for cross-border disputes, if there are foreign languages that are involved, whether the electronic discovery platform is able to work on that particular language. Um, obviously, we would also have to be mindful that, you know, with, with technology, there are uh, situations where there could be disruptions, for example, blackouts, and where you have no access to the documents because the server is down. And uh, there should also be uh, concerns about potential data breaches. But I believe those sort of issues are usually uh, well taken care of with, with the right platform. Uh, and finally, um, the last issue that I want to talk about um, in employing technology of this nature is that there could be potential time and monies that are now spent on the fight between lawyers, uh, between councils, on what the appropriate keywords are uh, to use to be employed in the electronic discovery process. So um, that's something we have to be mindful, for, uh, mindful of. And I think uh, councils as well as clients should be very familiar with the case itself so that they are able to generate the right keywords to apply in the electronic discovery platform. But that's it, uh, I'm a proponent of the use of technology, especially for uh, document intensive construction disputes, because uh, there are just so many studies that show that, you know, a machine is actually much more accurate than a human when it comes to the discovery process. And so with that, I'll hand the time over to Kushu. Great, thanks, Dana. So um, we've got lots of questions from everyone, and in the in the interest of time, I think let's try to read out some quick questions for our panelists to answer. Tom, let, let's start off with you. How is the measured malanalysis reflect geographical areas of low productivity, or how does the measured malanalysis reflect geographical areas of low productivity? Very tough question. <laughs> uh, Measured. So, so basically, what what you're trying to do is is uh, uh, I, I, I used different uh, approaches, I suppose, to try and get a, a wide range of of disruption. Uh, uh, so so if you have a wide project, uh, which is obviously geographical areas wide, you obviously be working in different areas. Uh, on different systems in different areas. So, so the, the, the approach is, is basically the same as if you are looking at uh, measured mile for a system, but you're, you're obviously trying to narrow it down area-wise because an area will be, uh, in terms of record keeping, I suspect a lot of contractors will be keeping records specific to an area because that's the team that's working in an area. So, so the, 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 the approach uh, whether you define it by area or trade or, or, or actually system or event, 
is just basically to try and narrow down the criticisms that you get with measured map because uh, Tom sorry I, we can't hear you unfortunately it's, it's there's not a is fact and disruption is specific to the project so the project itself the progress on site um, and exactly what was going on would define how that measured mile can actually be narrowed down to be uh, specific, i.e. Cause, cause and effect, and actually relating to the cost. So the idea of actually trying to get different uh, analysis by area, and then narrowing it down into systems, and then narrowing it down into trades, that gives you a wide range of disruption results, where at least now you can look at uh, addressing uh, issues of uh, 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 taking account of contractors on uh, inefficiencies, or it was to do with uh, sequencing or management issues, or it was to do with uh, uh, skilled, uh, lack of skilled resources. So by doing it in different uh, sort of different approaches for a specific disruption, I think it helps gives a, a wide range of results where you can actually have a minimum and maximum values. Uh, and that, that, that difference sort of addresses the criticisms that you might get on, on measured mile itself. Hopefully that, hof, hof that uh, answers or addresses some of the, uh, or the question itself. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Um, any experiences that the panel members can share about proving lost profits in construction? Recently, AG versus Global Water Associates is an example. What kind of evidentiary best practices can be used here? Maybe, Krina, I'll leave this to you to answer. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm familiar with the case and it's a very interesting, uh, it, 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 for those not familiar with this, so obviously I recommend the, the reading, but but in, in some, uh, the facts are relevant uh, in the context of the discussion, as well as obviously the applicable law. But on the facts, uh, in this particular case, uh, there, there were two contracts. One was for the construction. It, it was a water water of, of the plant and the, and the second contract was on the the, the second contract was on the actually the managing and operating of the plant. So the two together signed together, and and the uh, and the um, and and the owner was the obviously a government uh, um, the government the, the BVI in the context, uh, and and in the arbitration uh, the tribunal found that there was a breach of of the contract of the first one by the government of of BVI because it failed to provide the site of the works. Uh, but the tribunal rejected the, the, the claim for loss of profits uh, of global water, well, which was under the second contract for the operation of the plant. Uh, and I think this is where the question goes, because obviously in, in the context, uh, in a normal construction arbitration, uh, you, would, you would see this situation when, when you also have a, a subsequent operation and maintenance or management of, 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 the, of the project. So, so in this particular case, what, what the court did, or the, the Privy Council did was to um, set for the, the test for, um, for, for the, uh, well, remoteness, um, because this is what the tribunal said, well, this loss of profit is too remote and cannot be recovered. So the Privy Council looked looked at the facts, looked at the law first of all, and look at the criteria used uh, to establish uh, the existence or not of remoteness of the loss of profit, and and what was critical uh, in the in the decision was uh, the fact that um, at the time of the conclusion of both contracts, both parties knew uh, that there would be profits arising out of this. Uh, so obviously it relied heavily on the facts, uh, the fact that the contracts were signed at the same time, the fact that the government obviously knew that uh, the, the, the water reclamation plant would be operated, and obviously there, there would be profits out of this. So, so the, the Privy Council admitted the appeal. Uh, but again, uh, in a normal construction arbitration, 
I would say that you'd see this, uh, and I'm sure that Tom uh, and, and Dana and Zina, they probably have examples uh, when, when this situation would occur, but it's a, it's a high threshold, obviously, to, to meet. Thank you, Karina. Um, Zena, next one's for you. How do we limit the scope of cross-examination in construction arbitration proceedings? Thank you, Kushbu. Uh, this is a tricky question. Uh, limiting, the cross -exam limiting the scope of cross-examination, here we have to take into account uh, uh, some key consideration, which is due process. Uh, so generally, in, uh, in, in arbitration cases, the parties, they, uh, the, the tribunal would ask the parties to agree on a time envelope, and each party will uh, uh, is free to use the time as it wishes. Uh, as it wishes. So, so, so this is totally left to discretion of the parties, uh, and uh, and uh, like as long as each party has equal time uh, and they have, there is an equal time to be heard, uh, that would be fine. So limiting the, the, the scope of cross-examination is a bit tricky, especially in light of the due process. Uh, so so, so, so um, the parties need to know how to manage their time. Uh, and if one party does not know how to use its time and spends hours on cross-examining a witness or an expert uh, without the need to, so, so th this is a judgment, this is a, uh, an individual counsel judgment and we cannot do anything about it. And, and the tribunal cannot, cannot maybe can give some guidance, uh, but cannot intervene in it. Uh, so, so, so I think it's, it's the role of the council to be wise and to know how to use their time and, and to know on which witness or experts to spend more time or less time um, uh, in it. And, and finally, of course, the, the tribunal has the, 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 the they, they have, the, they, 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 they know how to conduct the proceedings. And of course, if, a witness is cross-examined or there are some questions that shouldn't be asked. So this is the role of the tribunal to, 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 to and, and the conduct uh, of the proceedings. So I hope this has answered the, the question. I'm sure it has. So we'll just move on in the interest of time. Um, Dina, how is COVID-19, the relevant legislation and social distancing measures in particular affect disruption claims and how can this be quantified in time and cost? Thanks, Kushbu. Um, so I'll just speak generally about my experience here in Singapore. Um, what the government has tried to do is to introduce uh, legislation here. We have a COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act. Um, so what the act seeks to achieve, um, at least in, re in relation to delay and, and disruption claims, would be to uh, say that for all projects, whether private or public sector projects, there is now an automatic extension of time of 122 days. And that 122 days is derived from the period of lockdown until the end of that period of lockdown in Singapore. And on top of that, um, developers will now have to co-share 50% of the qualifying costs with their contractors. And a qualifying costs, I mean here, uh, costs associated with, for example, extending your performance bond, um, insurance, uh, as well as any uh, higher purchase agreements, those would be qualifying costs. Um, so it's quite a blunt approach here that we've employed in Singapore. And if the um, amount of time that is awarded under the automatic extension, as well as the amount of monies that are awarded under that 50% co-sharing um, uh, uh, method is not sufficient, then contractors will have to fall back on the contract. And that would mean that they will have to fall back on the records that they have in proving their claims for disruption and or for delay. Yeah. Thanks, Dana. I mean, there are some really good questions which I would be happy to take offline just in the interest of time and to move on. Before we conclude today's webinar, let's hear from our speakers on their top tips in construction arbitration. Dana, let's start with you. What would be your tip, top tip in construction arbitration to our joiners today? 
Um, actually, for me, it would be to ensure that your record keeping is, is good. Um, as Tom says, it's all about the records. Even if you have a good claim, if you don't have the records, you can't make out that claim. And, and um, in addition to that, I would like to say that engage your claim consultants early to ensure that you have the right um, claim methodology that's employed, that you don't put in an inflated claim that is not necessarily credible. Yeah. What about you, Zena? Uh, I, of course, I totally agree with Dana. If I want to add uh, from a council perspective, uh, you need to know the facts. Uh, do not overwhelm the tribunal with unnecessary voluminous documentation. Uh, investigate the claims uh, before pursuing them. And uh, also do not hesitate to recommend settlement uh, when these are warranted to the client. And from an arbitrator perspective, I would say to encourage parties experts to adopt a collaborative approach as Tom already stated, and produce joint findings and discuss upfront issues such as methodology for, methodology for delays and issues of principle in relation to quantification. Uh, and finally, of course, experience in the industry is very important important. Thanks, Zena. Krina, what would be your advice for those involved or about to be involved in the construction arbitration? Well, I, I, I would speak of, uh, on behalf of the arbitrators more than uh, council. And, and I think that every, everything that was, has been said before, it's, it's really relevant. And, and it all goes back to uh, the early, uh, continuous and effective management of the case. Short and simple, but so true. Um, Tom, what about you? Your top tip from the perspective of an expert? Um, I would say move our projects to Singapore. <laughs> You'll have uh, all the COVID claims. Uh, the, uh, for me, I think it's uh, uh, disruption is a lost opportunity because contractors are just unprepared. They, they, uh, it's an elephant in the room. Uh, which they should actually start managing from day one. Okay, great. So with that, we will close today's session. Thank you very much for everyone who took the time to attend today, to our speakers for graciously accepting my invitation to participate in today's webinar, and to l Mimi's events team and Joanna in particular for all our tremendous hard work behind the scenes to make this event a successful one. I look forward to receiving any of your further comments or questions through email, and we would be very happy to continue our discussion on this interesting topic offline. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.